Chapter Twelve of Great Disasters and Horrors in the World's History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Great Disasters and Horrors in the World's History by Alan H. Godby. Chapter Twelve: Electric Storms. Far along, from peak to peak, the rattling crags among, leaps the live thunder not from one lone cloud but every mountain now hath found a tongue and jura answers through her misty shroud back to the joyous alps who call to her aloud and this is in the night most glorious night thou wert not sent for slumber let me be a share in thy fierce and far delight a portion of the tempest and of thee how the lit lake shines a phosphoric sea and the big rain comes dancing to the earth and now again tis black and now the glee of the loud hills shakes with its mountain mirth as if they did rejoice o'er a young earthquake's birth who has not quailed before the storm few indeed are they whose spirits kindle with the flash of the lightning and joy in the roar of the thunder that fills the heavens like the voice of many waters Bold is the heart that in such scenes can mount with a byron, and say to the avernane gloom that wraps the frightened world, Let me be a portion of the tempest and of thee. Only that fiery, untamable spirit, fearless of man or demon, dare so approach the king of the storm, or pat the mane of ocean in his wrath. A thousand plaudits he has won, but not a follower, for when the lightning flames and roars, the cheering rabble slink away in fear, nor dare to emulate that genius, strange and wild as chaos itself. The fear of the tempest belongs to every age. The ancient Greeks, from whom the Romans borrowed and modified the myth, told how Hephaetus toiled in his volcanic forge to form the bolts of Zeus, great father of gods and men. These flaming weapons could none oppose, by them rebellious giants were overturned, and the bold Goth, rugged and vigorous, heard the voice of the war-god Thor shout to him, Mine eyes are the lightning, the wheels of my chariot roll in the thunder. The Arab saw the wild combat of Genie, whom the great Solomon had not subdued. Woe to the luckless white, who should arouse their ill-will. The Arabian Nights tell us of a contest between one of these spirits of fire and a beautiful princess, versed in magic. The swarthy Moor beheld the hand of God, waving on his angels to contest with the hosts of evil, and the same idea of wild combat in the spirit world is found in the myths of the Caribs and Laps. In the Hindu cosmogony, the lightning and storm are the chief weapons of Siva, the destroyer, who will one day blot the world out of existence. Only in the red man's tales do we find the idea of the Christian world, of one great spirit who rules all nature. In the Persian mythology, lightning and gloom represent the contest between the forces of Ahiram, prince of evil, and Ormuzd, the great creator and preserver of good. And among the old Estruscans, from whom the Romans borrowed many rites and ceremonies, the lightning was one of the chief objects in their system of augury and divination. A favorable flash of lightning outweighed all portents of ill. The thunder was the voice of the god, communicating their will to men. And so the ancients were content to pass the mystery by unsolved. Now and then a Pliny, a Seneca, an Aristotle ventured a timid speculation upon the origin and cause of lightning, but as electricity was an unknown force to them, their conjectures were as wild as the chimerical tales of Cimmerian darkness in ultra-Scythian realms or of the utopian haven of bliss, where the Hyperboreans dwelt. But one of their various conjectures is worthy of note, as it contains an element of truth. It was, that the lightning was produced by mutual friction or violent concussion of the clouds. Since electricity has been recognized as the agent in the phenomena of thunderstorms, inquiry as to whether it is a cause or a result of the formation of clouds has produced evidence in favor of the latter fact though clouds differently charged have mutual attractions for each other. 
for rapid motion of gases may be made to generate electricity a natural sequence would be that thunderstorms are most violent where clouds are heaviest hence thunderstorms are naturally most frequent and violent in the tropics where the greater heat produces immense masses of vapor and are unknown in the polar world where the comparative dryness of the atmosphere is unfavorable the unusual amount of electricity in dense clouds in rapid motion is shown by the tremendous electrical displays attendant upon tornadoes and cyclones another illustration of lightning resulting from cloud agency rather than controlling them may be found in the cloudless sahara where evidences of electricity are sometimes to be observed in the time of the Kemsen, while the thunderstorm is unknown one notable exception to the rule that thunderstorms are violent and frequent in all tropical regions is to be found in peru with its cloudless skies and eternal sun where rainfall or thunderstorm would be as great a curiosity as a palm tree at the north pole the mere fact of elevation renders the thunderstorm more violent in mountainous regions in both temperate and tropical worlds knowing the character of this mysterious power we may not enter upon a lengthy discussion of the changes chemical physical and otherwise that may be produced by it within the scope of this work only its rank as an agent of destruction and a historical factor may be considered is electricity to be greatly feared or to be put on a par with the flood the hurricane and the earthquake has it ever figured in the history of nations sufficiently to directly affect their destinies the first and most familiar aspect of its power is the thunderstorm which needs not a word of description it results merely from the discharges passing between two bodies oppositely charged there is one comparatively rare form of lightning in which it appears as a globe of fire slowly descending with wayward and unexpected dashes to the side sometimes coming down a chimney and playing about the floor like a kitten much to the discomfiture of the inmates till it at length explodes with immense force hurling zigzag lightnings all about this peculiar freak several times observed is as yet unexplained the lightning seems throughout most civilized nations to be the most dreaded of all natural agencies if we may judge from the many precautions taken against it and in truth it is a terrific power cleaving the hardest rocks rending the mighty oak and fusing the most refractory substances darting into the soil it frequently forms tubes of vitreous appearance by fusing the earth and stones as it passes the writer has seen masses of straw fused in the same way and when we remember the french savants have with the most powerful of batteries been able to produce tubes only an inch in length and one fiftieth of an inch in diameter by passing shocks through powdered glass we may well stand in awe at the terrible power that produces tubes thirty feet long and four inches in diameter in the far more obstinate feldspar and quartz there are numerous cases of death by lightning but the instances in which more than one person has been killed by a flash are comparatively rare the freaks played far outdo those of the wind and puzzle the wisest march twentieth seventeen eighty four about four hundred people were assembled in the theatre at mantua when lightning struck the building and killed two persons injuring ten but many who were not hurt found the bolt had melted their watch keys earrings and split diamonds they were wearing how such feats could be performed without in the least harming the possessors is a mystery june eleventh eighteen nineteen while a large assembly were attending divine services in the church of chateau neuf le montaire in france lightning struck the building killing nine persons and wounding eighty two in seventeen fifteen the lightning fell into the abbey of normontier near tours and killed twenty-two horses but did no further harm to the one hundred and fifty monks at supper than to turn over their one hundred and fifty bottles of wine in eighteen fifty five lightning struck a flock of sheep in france killing seventy-eight of them and two dogs and sparing the old shepherdess a french author relates the case of a priest who was killed by lightning while the horse on which he rode was unhurt and quietly continued homeward with the stiffened corpse a somewhat similar case has come within the knowledge of the writer a man on horseback being killed and the saddle perforated yet the horse remained apparently unhurt i remember another instance of a man who was struck and escaped unharmed but one of his boots was torn to shred and some of the hobnails melted and i myself have been struck upon the foot 
with no other result than a peculiar numbness lasting nearly half an hour in many instances a livid streak is the only mark left upon the dead body and again it may be torn almost to atoms while in some cases not the slightest trace is perceptible the greater number fall in the first class in eighteen thirty eight some cattle were killed by lightning near nimiegen in holland their bones were shattered to a thousand fragments as though by nitroglycerine while externally there was no particular token visible some sheep killed in bohemia in seventeen eighteen were similarly served the fragments of bone were driven so thoroughly throughout the flesh that the carcasses were unfit for food in eighteen sixty nine the mayor of pradet france was killed by lightning and all his clothes with the exception of one shoe were torn from the body august eleventh eighteen fifty five a man was struck by lightning on a road near valerot and entirely divested of his raiment only a few remnants of which could afterward be found ten minutes after the stroke he was restored to consciousness complained of the cold and asked how he came to be without any clothing no doubt he would have more easily consoled himself for the loss of his apparel had he known of the case reported by sestier of a man whose whole right side was burnt as if he had been held for some time over a fire-pan while his shirt his drawers and the rest of his dress bore no marks whatever of combustion sometimes the clothing is found unstitched again it is burnt and again in some mysterious manner it seems to be annihilated Professor Tyndall relates his sensations upon having a powerful electric discharge pass through him. Life was absolutely blotted out for a very sensible interval, without a trace of pain. In a second or so consciousness returned. The intellectual consciousness of my position was restored with singular rapidity, but not so the optical consciousness. The appearance which my body presented to myself was that of a number of separate pieces, the arms, for example, were detached from the trunk and suspended in the air. In fact, memory and the power of reasoning appeared to be complete long before the optic nerve was restored to healthy action. But what I wish chiefly to dwell upon here is the absolute painlessness of the shock, and there can be no doubt that to a person struck dead by lightning the passage from life to death occurs without consciousness being in the least degree implicated. It is an abrupt stoppage of sensation, unaccompanied by a pang there is another class of peculiar freaks performed by this subtle force which the following instances illustrate professor perty tells of a thunderstorm in switzerland when the lightning sprang from a pear tree upon the veranda of a house where it killed a boy and wounded his mother the pear tree and the house were burned down on the arm of the wounded woman a remarkably elegant impression of twigs and leaves like a photographic copy of part of the pear tree was found there are several cases noted of persons sitting near windows when lightning flashed near by has produced an exact likeness of the person as though engraved on the glass in eighteen twenty five the lightning fell upon the brigantine en buon servo which lay at anchor in the bay of armiro at the mouth of the adriatic sea the superstitious ionian sailors generally fasten a horseshoe to the foremast of their ships probably fancying that this simple means affords them protection against the evil intentions of wizards and witches of course the buon servo was not without its horseshoe antonio theodoro of scarpanto was sitting near the mast when it was struck by lightning he was killed at once no marks of combustion were found on his body nor were his clothes torn but on his back was found the distinct impression of a horseshoe of the same size as that which was nailed to the mast in the records of the academy of sciences we find that the signora morosa the lady of lugano who sat near a window during a thunderstorm received a shock which did her no further injury but a flower which stood in the passage of the electric fluid was distinctly pictured on her thigh she carried the mark to her grave lightning is one of the most useful purifiers of the atmosphere there can be no doubt that large quantities of noxious exhalations are destroyed by electrical discharges its beneficial effect in this respect has long been noted both hippocrates and gallinus remark that the water which falls during a thunderstorm is more healthy to drink than that which proceeds from a uniformly clouded sky and plutarch mentions that the rain from a thundercloud is considered as more favorable to vegetation and communicates to plants a particular flavor there are also on record a number of instances in which persons long in poor health 
on receiving light shocks have greatly improved in health and appearance similar results have been noticed in plant life doubtless such cases as these give rise to the belief of the ancients that to be struck by lightning was to be favored by the gods this opinion was especially noted in the case of mithridates slightly wounded in the forehead by lightning when a child he escaped unhurt later in life when his sword was totally destroyed these facts caused him to be held in superstitious fear by the romans and quintus julius eburnus became consul b c mainly because of a similar mark of divine favor those who were killed by a flash were believed to be not subject to decay and were robed in white and buried where they fell so also those whose tombs lightning struck were peculiarly honored of heaven lord byron alludes to this in his stanza upon the bust of aristio on the poet's tomb at ferrara which had been struck by lightning the lightning rent from aristo's bust the iron crown of laurel's mimicked leaves nor was the ominous element unjust for the true laurel wreath which glory weaves is of the tree no bolt of thunder cleaves and the false semblance but disguised his brow yet still if fondly superstition grieves know that the lightning sanctifies below whate'er it strikes yon head is doubly sacred now the identification of electricity with lightning is a comparatively recent occurrence the story of benjamin franklin patron saint of the devout lightning rod agent is too familiar to require repetition yet the idea was first broached in the latter part of the seventeenth century by two students of the new force more than fifty years before franklin's experiments thunderclouds usually float from two thousand to five thousand feet from the earth but there is one case on record of two priests being killed by lightning from a cloud only thirty yards from the ground while another thunderstorm is noted as having occurred eighteen thousand feet from the earth as sound travels about one thousand and ninety feet per second any one may ascertain the distance of a flash by noting the time that elapses ere the thunder is heard all existing records fail to tell of thunder heard more than four miles while the cannonading at paris in eighteen seventy one could be heard one hundred and five miles and waterloo could be heard one hundred and fifty miles the action of lightning is instantaneous and when near by the report is at first a single sharp crack but it is always followed by a long rolling so characteristic that every name given the thunder in measure endeavors to imitate it the reason of the continued roll from a single flash is simple and is to be found in the fact that a flash usually travels several miles and as sound travels as stated above the sounds generated at different distances come to the ear in rapid succession resulting in a continuous roar as the flash is due merely to the attraction between two bodies charged with opposite kinds of electricity the discharge may pass either up or down cases are on record of persons on a mountainside being killed by lightning from a cloud below them and of people on the ground killed by lightning dashing from them toward the sky among the more notable fatalities resulting from lightning may be mentioned the terrible thunderstorm of seventeen ninety three at buenos aires when lightning struck thirty-seven times within the city and killed nineteen people a number of persons were killed on june eighteenth eighteen seventy two in england at different places and numerous others perished within the month from similar discharges electricity seems to kill by destroying nervous power cardenas tells of eight reapers being killed while taking their meal under an oak when the witnesses of the occurrence ran to the spot they saw a strange sight the victims seemed to be still busy with their frugal repast one of them held his glass another was putting some bread into his mouth a third had his hand in the dish the angel of death had struck them so violently that the whole surface of their bodies bore the marks of his black wings they seemed to be so many statues sculptured in black marble in another case where ten reapers were killed under a hedge one of them had a dog on his knee at the time when he was struck the unfortunate man was caressing with one hand his little companion and with the other giving him a piece of bread both master and dog were merely inert masses of rigid muscle and stiffened sinew and yet the bread was still held by the lifeless hand the dog with his mouth expressively open seemed to beg for the proffered morsel a peasant woman in the suburbs of nancy was struck while gathering flowers she was found standing holding in her hand the daisy she had been plucking 
a french soldier took refuge under a tree during a storm a peasant sheltered himself in a copse near by the soldier was killed by lightning the storm over the peasant crept out and called to the soldier to come on receiving no answer he went up and touched the erect motionless figure it at once melted away only a little dust remained a similar result occurred not long since in a powerful electric light plant a large rat endeavored to cross some of the machinery and at once became rigid as though an image of stone one of the employees taking a stick endeavored to push the carcass off it at once disappeared in a cloud of impalpable dust terrible results have followed from lightning striking into powder magazines august eighteenth seventeen sixty nine the powder vault in the tower of st nazaire at brescia was struck the explosion destroyed one-sixth of the city completely and damaged all buildings more or less three thousand persons were killed while the property ruined amounted to over three million dollars june twenty sixth eighteen o seven the lightning struck a magazine in the fortress of the luxembourg ruining the lower town and killing or wounding two hundred and thirty people in eighteen fifty six the powder vaults in the church of st john in the island of rhodes were struck more than two hundred people were killed instantly the lightning often shows in itself a sort of explosive power every one is familiar with the blasting of trees and the throwing of fragments to a great distance some unusually violent effects of this class have been noticed in seventeen sixty two stones weighing one hundred and fifty pounds were flung from a church in cornwall to a distance of one hundred and eighty feet in the shetland islands during the last century a rock of mica schist one hundred and five feet long ten feet broad and from three to five feet thick was in an instant torn by a flash of lightning from its bed and broken into three large and several smaller fragments one piece twenty-six feet long ten feet broad and four feet thick was merely inverted a second twenty-eight feet long seventeen feet broad and five feet thick was hurled over a high point to a distance of fifty yards another mass forty feet long was hurled still farther in the same direction quite into the sea certain localities seem to have peculiar attractive power for lightning on the norwegian coast is a narrow channel between two dark rocky headlands where the lightning seems often to play almost incessantly the gloomy chasm so frequently reverberating with the roll of the thunder is viewed with superstitious fear by ignorant sailors and the boldest heart is filled with awe in the foreboding presence of the lies fjord but many he is thought a venturesome captain who will dare take his vessel through this frowning gateway but after careful consideration of the topic it is clear that lightning is less to be feared than almost any other of the atmospheric phenomena comparatively rare are the cases where more than one or two persons are killed at once statistics hitherto collected show that scarcely one death in two thousand is occasioned by it and yet no force seems to be so universally feared every people in every age have taken precautions against it while the hurricane and the flood pass almost unheeded the ancient thracians were wont to shoot their arrows at the sky during a storm to remind the fire gods to be a little more careful in their sport a similar practice is found among certain south african tribes while the south sea islanders far more fearless tell of inna a woman whom the moon stole for his wife while she was beating bark cloth she may be seen in the moon to-day the figure we call the man in the moon continually at work she spreads out her cloth on the sky to dry clouds fastening it down with blue stones of which the sky is built when done she gathers it up throwing down the stones which falling upon the earth produce the sound of thunder the lightning is the torch the moon holds to aid her in her work augustus was wont to retire to a subterranean vault during a storm and it is said the japanese emperors had a similar custom having the additional precaution of large reservoirs of water over the grottoes when away from home augustus usually wrapped himself in sealskin believed not only by the romans but by many others to be lightning-proof in some portions of france the peasants believe snake skins to be an efficient anti-lightning charm and among not a few of the ancients there was a belief prevalent that lightning never injured a person in bed in the passage quoted from byron on the bust of aristio allusion is made to the belief that lightning never strikes the laurel plant sacred to apollo firm in this opinion tiberius during thunderstorms 
put on a laurel crown and similar virtue is today ascribed by the chinese to peach and mulberry trees not a few persons today believe glass to be a safeguard and that a person is safe beside a closed window seamen and not a few of the peasantry of different regions believe the firing of guns will break up a thunderstorm a tolling of church bells is another powerful protection against the fires of the sky which has cost many a bell ringer his life a tall steeple being unusually liable to be struck and a damp bell rope forming a good conductor one authority tells us of three hundred and eighty six steeples struck within thirty three years and one hundred and twenty one bell ringers killed the preventative was all right but these tollers had sinned away all right to protection and perished as victims of divine wrath instead of an absurd custom such are some of the many illusory modes of protection in vogue in times past and existing to no small extent in the present comment upon them is unnecessary we know to-day that the higher objects are most liable to be struck and that metals are the best conductors and on these facts the whole system of lightning-rod protection is based but in regard to even the best conductors a witty german has found much room for ridicule while i am writing this symptoms of dysentery are showing themselves with us in gottingen six persons are said to have died of this complaint that is more than twice as many in a few days as the lightning has killed in our town in half a century and yet the public seems remarkably easy upon the subject i do not even find that the cheapest dysentery conductors have been resorted to people still go about in light clothing although the wind is already blowing over the stubble and i have even perceived within the last few days that some persons sleep with open windows which are very carefully closed during a thunderstorm and yet there is not a single instance known that lightning has ever made its way through an open window while dysentery very easily strikes into a bedroom particularly when after a warm day it makes its appearance in company of rain and cool wind is not this singular how would people conduct themselves in these days if the dysentery were to rise above the horizon in the form of a low black cloud changing day into twilight and whenever it selected a victim explode with a violent thunderclap which made the house shake i believe there would be no end of singing and praying and yet this storm is now impending on our heads but without thunderclaps and black clouds which are after all only accessories and we go about our affairs as if nothing were happening the fact that objects reaching much above the general surface are most liable to be struck places ships at sea in a peculiarly dangerous position and considering the relative number of the two ships are more frequently struck than houses the packet boat new york was struck some years since the chain which was attached to the mainmast as conductor was entirely volatized not being large enough to act as conductor the fact that electricity passes most readily from elevated points renders the ship the scene of the most beautiful of the more common electric phenomena any one who has visited an electric plant knows how sparks and flashes of light accumulate on the brushes and a similar spectacle may at times be seen on the wires of electric lights at night so at sea during cloudy weather the yards masts spars and more prominent points often glow with pale lambent flames of greenish or bluish tint one who clambers up them may find upon near approach that they almost disappear while to one a short distance away they are as distinct as ever a hand plunged into the flame glows with the same spectral light this phenomenon is popularly known among sailors as st elmo's fire but there is much difference of opinion as to what it may forebode some sailors believe the ghost of a dead comrade is accompanying the ship others consider that st elmo has taken the ship under his protection a more common and the rational view is thus given by longfellow last night i saw st elmo's stars with their glimmering lanterns all at play on the tops of the masts and the tips of the spars and i knew we should have foul weather to-day cheerily my hearties yo heave o oh. brail up the mainsail and let her go as the winds will and st antonio this phenomenon has been noticed from the earliest times shakespeare wrote three centuries ago in the tempest prospero hast thou spirit performed to point the tempest that i bid thee ariel to every article i boarded the king's ship now on the beak now in the waist the deck in every cabin i flamed amazement sometimes i'll divide and burn in many places on the topmast the yards and bowsprit would i flame distinctly 
then meet and join. When Lysander was about to set sail from Lampsacus to attack the Athenian fleet, Castor and Pollux appeared upon each side of the Lacedaemonian admiral's vessel, greatly encouraging him. Such were the names of the strange lights among the ancients, and ever and anon we find record of their appearance. This title needs explanation. This particular halo is not confined to the sea, nor to inanimate objects. The electric aurorle has been frequently observed upon persons, and has always been considered a good omen. The Spartan Gallippus, on his march to raise the siege of Syracuse, saw a star upon his lance and rejoiced at the token of divine favor. Nearly every Tiro in Latin is familiar with the tale that Servius Tullius, when a child, was found asleep in his cradle with flames playing about him, and was in consequence educated like a prince and became king of Rome. Stories of halos about Constantine the Great and the Visigoth emperor Wamba are also told. It is said that during Caesar's African war, flames sprang from the standards of the Fifth Legion during a stormy night, and at a time when Rome, almost in despair at the triumphs of Carthage and the death of two Scipios in Spain, was seriously meditating the abandonment of the contest, Lucius Martius ventured upon a harangue to encourage the dispirited legions. While he spoke, a flame rested upon his helmet. Roused by the wonderful mark of divine favor, the Romans went forth again and gained one of their greatest victories. What might have been the fate of the world if Carthage, not Rome, had prevailed? Who dare assert that an electric flame has not changed the destinies of the universe? But the earliest story of this sort comes from the famed expedition of the Argo in search of the Golden Fleece. During a fearful storm, Orpheus invoked the gods of Samothracia, and immediately divine lights appeared upon the heads of Castor and Pollux, two members of the party, and the storm ceased. So after death the two mythical heroes were promoted a place among the demigods, and became the especial patrons of sailors, and the strange lights on shipboard were supposed to indicate their presence. A single light, however, was supposed to bode evil, and to be the work of the mischief-making Helena. Since the extension of travel and scientific research, this phenomenon has been so frequently observed as to be no longer considered remarkable and it is supposed to be due to electric clouds or currents coming into direct contact with objects, so that instead of the flash of lightning from a distance, there is a steady discharge, often with some hissing or crackling sound, noticeable at the brushes of any electric machine. In fact, the noise is seldom absent. It almost invariably appears before or after a thunderstorm, and has hardly ever been observed during one. To this same cause must be attributed the occasional showers of luminous rain and dust. But no amount of science can rob such appearances of their terrors for the uninitiated. Of scores of instances we might name, a single one will suffice. Professor Siemens tells of an unusual electric disturbance during a Kamsen, while his party and his Arab guides were upon the summit of the Great Pyramid. Hearing a hissing noise as the wind rose, he at length concluded it must be due to electricity, and holding up a full wine bottle, the head of which was coated in tin foil, the same hissing sound was increased. The bottle was then wrapped with moist paper to increase its capacity. Even before this, a severe shock could be obtained from the head of the bottle. The Arabs, who for some time had been looking on with astonishment at our proceeding, came to the conclusion that we were practicing magic, and insisted upon our leaving the pyramid. Their remonstrances being of no avail, they now wanted to use the right of the stronger and to make us descend by force. I retreated to the highest stone block and loaded my bottle as strongly as possible, while the leader of the Arabs seized me by the other hand and was endeavoring to drag me down. At this critical moment I touched him with the neck of the bottle, and the effects of the shock it produced were such as to surpass my keenest expectations. The son of the desert, whose nerves had never before felt a similar commotion, fell flat upon the ground as if struck by lightning, and then, springing up with a dreadful howl, soon vanished out of sight, followed by all his comrades. These cases of halos and electric aureoles, thus far mentioned, have clearly played a far more important part in the history of nations than the more frequently occurring lightning stroke, merely because of the wonderful hold they have upon the superstitious tendency of man leave Servius Tullius out of the history of Rome, or leave out the speech and aurole of Marcius, and who can say how different the face of the earth might be? More frequently observed, and because of its frequency comparatively unheeded in northern climes, is the aurora, 
which in the temperate zone has frequently inspired terror equal to the earthquake although absolutely harmless the writer recalls that a bright aurora not so very many years ago caused not a few superstitious folk to believe the end of the world was at hand they believed the red streamers to be the chariot of fire in which the lord was speeding earthward this was the great aurora of september third eighteen fifty nine which was visible from the united states to siberia from the cape of good hope and australia to the north of europe it was the most tremendous ever known and well calculated to terrify the superstitious footnote and even so late as eighteen seventy two the brilliant aurora which was seen as far south as alexandria was believed by the intelligent parisians to forebode terrible wars and the speedy overthrow of the hated germans who had so lately trampled their capital and their pride and in earlier days the northern light had been deemed the harbinger of war of famine and pestilence and a footnote humboldt and other scents have supposed the aurora to be light emitted by the earth itself but to-day its electric character is proven beyond doubt electric discharges passed through a tube containing greatly rarefied dry air produce the same effect on a small scale and every aurora produces a powerful disturbance of magnetic instruments in most cases they are attended by a hissing crackling noise so the siberians are wont to say that the raging host is passing we find occasional references to the aurora among ancient writers but little attempt to explain it so we have even few myths if not being common enough in warmer climes to hold a place in popular tales but in iceland and more northern regions it is of constant and brilliant occurrence merely because it requires dry air and the coldest air is the driest so among scandinavian races appears the myth embodied by longfellow in the saga of king olaf the war-god thor speaks the light thou beholdest stream from the heavens in flashes of crimson is but my red beard blown by the night wind affrighting the nations and scott has told us of the belief in scotland and the northern isles of spirits abroad in the upper air the monk gazed long on the lovely moon then into the night he looked forth and red and bright the streamers light were dancing in the glowing north so he had seen in fair castile the youth in glittering squadron start sudden the flying genet wheel and hurl the unexpected dart he knew by the streams that shot so bright that spirits were riding the northern light the light emitted by the aurora varies much in intensity ordinarily it is not greater than that of the moon in her first quarter but a few instances are recorded where it was powerful enough to make itself perceptible by day and on one occasion it was strong enough at night to cast a shadow in the midst of a newfoundland fog as the phenomenon has been carefully studied only within a century it is not safe to affirm with certainty what records of the past three hundred years have induced many to believe that is of special frequency at periods of one hundred and fifty years this can only apply to the temperate zones for in the polar world it is to be seen on almost every clear still night m martins has given us a striking picture of the auroras at times they are simple diffused gleams or luminous patches at others quivering rays of pure white which run across the sky starting from the horizon as if an invisible pencil were being drawn over the celestial vault at times it stops in its course the incomplete rays do not reach the zenith but the aurora continues at some other point a bouquet of rays darts forth spreads out into a fan then becomes pale and dies out at other times long golden draperies float above the head of the spectator and take a thousand folds and undulations as if agitated by the wind they appear to be at but slight elevation in the atmosphere and it seems strange that the rustling of the folds as they double back on each other is not audible generally a luminous bow is seen in the north a black segment separates it from the horizon its dark color forming a contrast with the pure white or red of the bow which darts forth the rays extends becomes divided and soon presents the appearance of a luminous fan which fills the northern sky and mounts nearly to the zenith where the rays uniting form a crown which in its turn darts forth luminous jets in all directions the sky then looks like a cupola of fire blue green red yellow and white vibrate in the palpitating rays of the aurora but this brilliant spectacle lasts only a few minutes 
the crown first ceases to emit luminous jets and then it gradually dies out a diffuse light fills the sky here and there a few luminous patches resembling light clouds open and close with an incredible rapidity like a heart that is beating very fast they soon get pale in their turn everything fades away and becomes confused the aurora seems to be in its death throes the stars which its light had obscured shine with renewed brightness and the long polar night sombre and profound again assumes its sway over the icy solitudes of earth and ocean in the presence of such brilliancy and beauty both poet and artist may despair it may be copied only by the master hand that sent it flaming through the heavens there is naught under the sun whereunto to liken it and it is the electric flash which men may least fear and yet even it has wrought evil times for its magnetic power disturbs the compass and the electric storms it betokens have more than once in the past caused electric wires to set objects near them on fire i well remember the powerful electric disturbances that attended a magnificent aurora in 1884 which was visible as far as southern arkansas depots were fired in many places by electric switchboards one in pennsylvania taking fire four times during this electric storm telegraphs and telephones were temporarily useless such are the phenomena presented in the atmosphere by this most mysterious power dreadful in the lightning's leap strange and uncanny in the aurora's glow wildly and weirdly beautiful in the flickering flash and flow of the northern light we have seen that though it has played an important part in the history of the world because of its appeal to man's superstition it is notwithstanding the occasional bolt of death to be considered while one of the most powerful and universal one of the least to be feared of all the forces of nature and is practically responsible for a few great disasters End of chapter 12